candle. <coughs> so I can't remember if there was anything brewing from before tea or during the tea break. Anybody wants to start with? Well, I was thinking out loud in the tea break. So, since everything happens anyhow, always has done, always will and does now, the um, idea or the separate, the idea of person somehow on top must be very thin, must be very ephemeral, nothing, but appears obviously to be a very strong, tenuous thing. And that doesn't, that's all, that was just a, an observation. Yeah, it certainly seems to have some sticking power, doesn't it? Some glue mm. to it. Yeah, it's a mystery, yeah. yeah. Yes. Super, I mean, super glue. Super glue, yeah. I mean, I'm tempted to say that it's just a thought, but of course it's not. It's an energy which is far more than a thought, isn't it? I mean, the, the word that's often used to describe it is, um, yeah, there's a kind of contraction takes place, it's like a tightness. Contraction. And what I say about that is it is a kind of contraction, a sort of constriction, a sort of tightness, but it can't be felt as such until it's gone, because it's the normal, as in the common or usual state in which we live. And so it just feels like natural. When it's gone, you know, if that contraction loosens and disappears, and then there's a kind of <gasps> relaxation, a sort of a loosening. And, I mean, I don't know if this image I've used for years, I don't know if it works, it's a bit like wearing a too tight shoe, but you've always worn it. So you don't notice the pain or the difficulty, but it just seems natural to you. But if that's suddenly taken away, or wearing a corset which suddenly taken off you, and then you can experience what it's like to be able to breathe properly. But, you know, it's a complete... Well, it's just like everything else, it's a complete mystery. So, so we have a misplaced sense of agency, don't we? We think, as a human being, I've got agency. Uh, yeah. yeah, I resist yeah. the word misplaced, because to say misplaced seems to suggest that there's something wrong with it. And there isn't anything wrong with it, it's just how things are. Yeah, a sense okay. of agency, yeah. It's a sense, but there's no real agency we have. I no. Have. No. Well, it's not that there's no real agency that we have, it's that there's no we to have it. <laughs> I mean, maybe there is a free-floating real agency, I don't know how that would work. The point is, not that, the point is there's no we who has that. It's, you look puzzled by that. Well, yes or no? Because, because you've got the that, thing, that play by that, that Mozart, I forgot who it was, where, where Mozart was seemed to just channel. Yes. Yeah. It was just happened to be there and just yeah. channeled that, that, that music. But it wasn't coming from him, it was just being channeled through. Was that? Which I'm sure you know is an experience in some form that probably many of us sitting in the room. I've had, I don't mean sort of channeling glorious music, but sort of like just stuff appears and like where the hell did that come from? So, yeah. but in, a, in a sense, to put it like that is still to kind of make a statement about separation, isn't it? I mean, that's not really, I mean, that's what, that's still part of the dream or this dream or this appearance because there seems to be a me who is separate from something else, whatever that is, which seems to be able to channel this glorious music through me. It's a lovely story, it really is, and I think it, it, it's a good metaphor for um, describing what kind of experience sometimes by some people on an emotional uh, and more than emotional level, I want to say a spiritual and creative level, but it's still a story of separation. There's something out there that somehow challenged, ch channels divine music through me to you. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's also kind of nonsense in terms of what we're talking about here. But it is beautiful. There seems to be a, a lot of reports from authors and, and musicians and composers and painters, etc. artists, 
that when a really decent piece of work arrived, they a lot say, oh, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It wasn't. Yes, absolutely. Wasn't, yeah. Not, yeah. Without all this paraphernalia of channeling through, yeah. just the experience of it, I didn't do it. Yeah. So any, any, every, anything I do, I think is good. I know I haven't done it. Yeah. It just happens. Yeah. And yet, when it comes to the more mundane, like I don't know, you know, screwing an IKEA bookshelf yeah, yeah, together or true. something, somehow, you know, we may have the feeling that I did that, but we didn't do that either. That too is channeled. That's very useful. You could yeah. say. I mean, no, yeah, it's good. Yeah. 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 Everything's shown in Well, in a way, I mean, I was, as, I'm, as I was saying, sorry, I kind of resist that because that too is a statement of separation. Mm. There's something separate from this which channels some energy which enables this to perform the amazing, magnificent task of putting an IKEA bookcase together or whatever, or write a concerto. It's still a kind of statement of so. In, 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 in actuality, everything is happening. That's it. As a mystery, let's stick with that word mystery, yeah, on its, if you like, on its own. Everything appears to be happening, it's all a mystery. It's a com what? You know, that? Fingers appearing and moving, and a voice, and hearing, and it's a complete mystery. And it's just happening. Experience is the mystery, there's only experience. I don't know whether it's because I decided I'd like to enjoy, you know, some really, really glorious headaches, but I've been banging my skull a little bit, only a little bit, because it's all I could bear, um, against, up against some videos about consciousness, mm -hmm. awareness, mm -hmm. and so forth, and the hideous attempt to try to dis explain this and so forth. It's a complete mystery, there's experience. That's all, that's all there is in terms of what's happening. There's nothing and everything, and the everything, you could say, contains experience. The experience is part of the everything. Out of nothing comes everything, apparently, and that experience is... How does that happen? How? What? Total mystery. Total mystery. <clears throat> By experience, do you mean aliveness? I mean anything that's happening. Anything that's happening. I mean, is it an energetic aliveness? You could describe it as that, yeah. Yeah, you could describe it as that, but I mean... Yeah. Taste of water, weight of glass in hand. Awareness of movement, awareness that if that movement becomes too strong, water will spill, <laughs> or whatever. Really, really simple. Yeah. Every phenomenon, every phenomenon, yeah. And of course, there has to be aliveness for that, yeah. But you know, that somehow makes, again, it's so tricky this because that immediately sort of sounds like. A sort of separation. We've got different things there. We've got experience, we've got aliveness, we've got consciousness that's aware of it. No, it's just words fail, but I'll go for the well known phrase whatever's happening. It's just whatever's happening. Yeah. Because there's nothing to reference, is there? It's all self referencing. How do you mean it's all self reference? Well, when I say it references itself, there's nothing else than yeah, that or this yeah. or the other. There's nothing to explain it by. You know, normally we explain things by something else. Yeah. Or understand it with from somewhere else. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. And all, all explanation fails with this. It's like yeah. we've gone back to the bedrock and all explanation fails. Yeah. yeah, it's why kind of these sort of interminable videos, I'm sure most of them are only an hour and a half, but they seem to be like 17 hours each explaining consciousness and so for the kind of so like, oh my god, man. bring me the revolver now, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there a difference between a tangible and an intangible experience? Because I think that 
and consciousness. Is there what? Difference. Between it? Uh, it, yeah. A difference. Between. A difference. Yeah. Uh, between uh, attention and, uh, and consciousness. I say one difference is we could probably have a shot at defining, you know, intelligently what um, attention means. There's no chance of doing that with consciousness. There's experience, there's experience, isn't there? And then there's something within that. There's an experience, and which I suppose we call a, a, you know, attention. And so it makes sense to us. So, oh, you know, I pay great attention to that. And I hardly <coughs> notice that. So there's, they're just two different experiences. Like every other experience arising out of nothing. <coughs> And then we tend to say, oh, well, there must be something called consciousness for that to happen. But well, why? There's experience. You know, the, the, the one inescapable... I'm hesitating because I don't want to say the word truth because I distrust it, but I will use it here just because I can't think of a better word. The one escapable truth, or if you like, fact of existence, is there's experience. When somebody denies that, you know they're lying. Or insane, you know, probably lying. I also think there's a cultural fallacy on how we define paying attention. Often we go to school and someone says, pay attention, we kind of like squint our eyes and concentrate on something that we say, you're paying attention. Well, you're actually not. You're kind of rejecting. <coughs> everything outside so you can focus yeah. on one thing. So yeah. pure attention would be to focus on everything. So I can see a similarity of when you're truly paying attention, you're not focused on one thing and you're embracing everything around you. And if you were really paying attention, you would notice everything rather than just one thing. So I think there is a a, sim a similarity of attention and consciousness is just the way that we define it is actually about excluding everything away. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe that. Yeah, but that, let's not lose sight of the fact that what we're really talking about here is the possibility of seeing, I'll stick with that word, that there is no one who pays attention, there is no one who has experience, there is no one who is worst of all conscious, you know, there is experience happening, there is focusing happening or not, there is paying attention happening or not, but there's no one at the centre of that in that sense, there's no one for whom that's happening, that's really all we're talking about here, the possibility of seeing that and, you know, by the way, somehow arising out of the seeing of that, that this is an arising of unconditional love. Arising out of? It's, this is an arising of unconditional love. Yeah. Which also is an experience, though. It's also experiencing unconditional love. Uh, yeah, I know I'm kind of wiggling around, so, you know, here, you know, that in a way, actually, I resist that as well, because... Well, it's, yeah, but, uh, it's because an experience implies an experiencer. But, you know, we don't, let, we don't need to get bogged down with that. Experience is fine, you know, it's just yeah. it's so far beyond what we think of as an experience. It's a bit misleading, but all language about this is misleading. Well, we always talk from this point of view. Yeah. Most of the time, think and talk yeah. from this point of view. The, the revelation is that there's no one experiencing this and there is no one that needs to experience this for this all simply to be seen to be arising. Yeah, that's the revelation. Is attention the same as thought? Not to me it isn't, no. And I think that, no. No, I mean, to me, no, I wouldn't want to get, you know, thought is blah, 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 the next blah, 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 that goes through what seems to be a mind but isn't really a mind. You know, I think I'll have fish and chips for supper. 
and the tension is when the fish and chips on my plate and like, oh, <laughs> you know, the tension for me, it's like focus. But again, the, the real point here, you know, in a, in a sense none of that matters, I mean it matters if it matters, but the real point here is that there is no one having the thoughts and there is no one paying the attention. Attention may happen, thoughts may arise, but for no one. That's the kind of, that's half the important bit but for no one. The other half of the important bit is, and it's unconditional love. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, but I keep forgetting that. Yeah. Well, the, in a way, the clues in the language of what you said there, I, yeah, the I, of course. The I can't understand it, the I can't get it, and insofar as it can to some extent, it then keeps forgetting it, of course, yeah. That's the nature of the eye. Yeah, I, I resonate. But, yeah. but the, the habit keeps going back. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Is your apparent eye still having is your apparent eye still having the difficulty of realizing it? Realizing what? You I thought understand? that's gonna be an easy question. I thought you were gonna stop at the word difficulty. Is your apparent life still having difficulty? I'm going to go, yeah. But you didn't stop there, you went on. Like, uh, you said, I can't get it. The I, the I can't, can't get, get it. it, yeah. Is it, is it still the same for your apparent eye? Or it, it has become different over the years, like a habit <coughs> of clear seeing, even for the eye? I, I, no, it's not a habit, and I, I, I never use, I don't think I use the phrase clear seeing. I, I, it's like it's kind of seen it's seen or it's not seen and once it's seen in its fullness then it's kind of game over and then whatever happens after that is just whatever happens after that life goes on until it doesn't I don't know if that gets anywhere near Answering your question, I, I'm not sure. The reason I'm asking is, uh, it feels like for me it was seen and the game is over. I can see that uh, from how I experienced the life from now. I mean, for a certain uh, since a certain uh, time. But when I ask the nature of things to my mind, it still feels like the mind is clueless. The mind is clueless. Clueless oh, about yeah. the reality, the yeah. nature of things. <laughs> so I'm wondering how long will it go on like this? Forever or? Probably. The mind is clueless, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's more likely that the mind will realize, I mean, there isn't really a mind, of course, but let's just use this language. It's more likely that the mind will realize if it's clueless when this has been seen. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that searching tends to stop when this has been seen, because the mind realizes it's got no hope. It doesn't even exist, so obviously it has no hope. You know, this is then realized as a mystery not to be, I mean, up to that point, I mean, if the mind is kind of philosophical or spiritually inclined or something like that, it might tend to see this as a mystery which it can plumb the depths of and finally resolve or whatever. Once this has been seen, then the mind can, it doesn't really exist, but nevertheless, the mind can then relax when it realises the hopelessness. You know, it, the mind can never understand this, it can never plumb it, it can never... If it, it can make sense of it, but that sense would always be fraudulent. And so then at last, oh, I can relax now. There's no hope. So, oh, blessed relief. Blessed relief from hope. Now there can be relaxation. I'm talking about this as if it's purposive, as if it's a decision that's made. That is, of course, rubbish.
is just notice that very often what happens when this is seen, relaxation takes place. I think part of that relaxation, maybe only a part of it, is due to the realization which that the realization that that which can never be understood can't be understood. How wonderful. I can give up. Well, that sounds very purposive. So there may now be a giving up. Oh, wonderful. God, I don't have to spend the next 30 years finishing my treatise on the true nature of God. Firstly, because the true nature of God cannot be known. And secondly, because there isn't a God. Whatever. And so... When the mind sees its true helplessness, maybe it can kind of go to rest and remember. I have to keep going back to that that we're talking about something that doesn't exist anyway. The mind doesn't exist. There's no entity called the mind. There's a process which we we call the mind, and some of us, particularly psychologists may be mistake for the mind. In other words, we reify it, we turn a process into a thing. I mean, really, the, the more helpful language would be to talk about minding, you know, using the present participle, you know, what's happening here is that minding is going on. But we don't say that, we say, oh, you know, my mind's full of thoughts about tomorrow. Almost every word in that sentence is misleading. My, no it's not my, mind. Mind, no there's no such thing as a mind, there's only a process of thinking. Is My mind is thinking about tomorrow, there's no such thing as tomorrow either. So a lot of our, you know, a lot of the things we say in everyday language like that, it'd be like a, sort of, you know, I mean, if I was into conspiracy theory, I'd say they keep us in the dream or the matrix or whatever it might be. No, it's just the way, it's the way stuff happens. A lot of stuff happens kind of reconfirming to the non-existent self that it's existent, that it does exist. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, listen to, to this, uh, how you talk. It triggers understanding. And, and it... It's sort of it's it's not about like the mind is there or not, but understanding it's just runs yeah. naturally in response to whatever you're talking. And so, what what do you what was what what would you comment on this understanding this movement of understanding? What would I comment on? That? <coughs> like like these triggers. The, okay, this triggers the mind to run and try and understand and try and digest what you're saying. So the, these, these, these sort of uh, understanding, I mean, to, to me, is like suffering, isn't it? Say that last bit again about suffering. The, Trying try to understand what you're talking is suffering. It may be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It may be much more relaxing not to try to understand. Yeah. But, well, well, And that, in, in apparent time, can be a process which takes place. It happens to many apparent people. It, you know, to start with, there's a trying to understand, and that creates a lot of suffering, and then over the appearance of time, maybe some kind of battle fatigue starts to take place, and then that trying to understand just falls away, and that is more relaxing. I mean, we can't do that. I mean, if I'm at a talk and I'm trying to understand, I can't force myself not to try to understand. That's ridiculous, you know, but that might simply happen. And then there's still the same amount of understanding, in other words, probably none, with stuff with this, but there's more relaxation. But 
and that trying to understand will go on for as long as it does. I want to say, you know, eventually that psychophysical system will just get tired of that and it'll stop. But I don't mean that there's a decision to be made or anything purposive that will happen, it's just that's a process that seems to take place. Yeah, I, I can feel he's trying to understand. Yeah. yeah. That's the happening. Yeah. That I'm, I'm supposed to have no idea of what's happening. Well, the I'm supposed to, I forget about that. There's no I'm supposed to here. There's no rules, there's no... There's nothing to be achieved. I'm supposed to implies there's something to be <coughs> achieved. There's nothing to be achieved. But I was like you when I first came across this for a long time. I was trying, trying, trying and asking questions after question after question. And then after a while that energy just kind of ran out. It's a mystery. Yeah, yeah so, so just no one, no one is... The stop till that's gone by because I cannot... No one, no one is here. Yeah. Trying, but not yeah. trying. Yeah. Yeah. And even, even if things that you know what's happening, this is kind of a, a very, very strong belief here. He just knows what's happening. Well, if it thinks it knows what's happening, that's a strong belief because one thing we can guarantee is that. We don't know what's happening. It's a well, mystery. Well, the, the, like, the car just went by. Oh, on that level, yeah. On that level. Do you know what, what that means? Well, on that level, we could say, in common speak, I know that a police car or a fire engine went by. Of course, that's just a common way of speaking. Actually, you know, there was just this sound arose and there was an experience. So you know that. But on that kind of level, but that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about the mystery of this magical appearance. Yeah. But you don't know a police car went by. No. No, but the character thinks it does. Yeah. So do you know? I don't know. What? This, this car. No, that's an assumption. Of course, cool. yeah. So where, where, where does this belief system at the mind? Mind you, without these assumptions, <coughs> this puppet, that puppet, that puppet couldn't function. Of course, you know it goes back to you know, you know nobody really believes in chaos. They may say they do, but they don't. You can tell that because they get out of bed in the morning. And, you know, if you don't get that, ask me afterwards. So where, where, where is this? I'm very new to this, um, so I have no clue much reading at all. Why do we not think the mind exists? Well, what's wrong with thinking a mind? What's wrong with even saying or talking about the mind? Oh, well, there's nothing wrong at all about it. I'm just not, absolutely nothing wrong. I'm just saying, as a matter of fact, the mind doesn't exist as a thing. You know, I mean, I don't think, you know, I mean, there's nothing particularly contentious about that. I mean, there's a process that goes on. There's a, you know, I mean, it's kind of pretty self-evident. There's a process, and that process is of thoughts arising, feelings arising. Mm -hmm. um, I'm desperately wondering whether there's a, something else that arises for the apparent mind. Mm -hmm. There's thoughts. But those most thoughts tend to, I'd say for the average person, mm -hmm. come so thick and fast and they tend to have so much energy attached to them that they kind of create the impression that there's this thing called the mind behind <coughs> those thoughts which has some kind of magical power to generate them. Actually there's just the thoughts, there's just the feelings, there's just the sensations, there's just the perceptions. We put those all together and say, oh, well, that's the mind. Well, no, it isn't. It's a process. If you like, I mean, use the word mind, and really what I'm 
uh, trying to say is the mind, if we want to use that word, the mind is a process, it's not a thing. Yeah, no, I get, I, I, yeah, I completely get the point. Um, I'm just very I'm conscious of, um, isn't it the mind saying that the mind is not a thing as well, though? Isn't that just no. a thought? Yes, it's a thought. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a thought, thinking, that the mind doesn't exist. Yes, it's not the mind saying that, it's, a, it's, it's another thought coming. And then another thought coming about, you know, oh gosh, isn't this wonderful deep philosophy that we're talking about here? And then another thought comes, I wonder if I'll have cheese on toast tonight. Yeah. And then another thought comes, perhaps my train won't run, and, and, and so it goes on. I think what impresses me is your certainty. <laughs> it's um, not my certainty. Well, it's, the, the cer there's a certainty from your, um, from what I'm, pick what I'm picking up, um, which I'm very much in constantly doubting everything at. Right. So, um, yeah, like, I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of impressed with you. There's a sense of knowing what I'm in the sense of like, well, this is again another thought, another thought, doubting constantly and doubting. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there may be a kind of key point there, is yeah, but there's nobody sitting here who knows. But there may be a sense of knowing, I don't know, there's nobody here who owns that. Yeah. There's a process here, and I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of fairly obvious with the mind. It's a bit less obvious with what seems to be physical stuff, like the body. But this chair is also a process. It's not an object, it's a process. It's yeah. quite difficult to see that. So a spiritual teacher, for example, may, if they're into this kind of technique, tell you to watch the gaps in your thoughts, and through that you might begin to see that the mind doesn't exist as a thing. They won't tell you to watch the gaps in the chair, even though they are also there, but they're much more difficult to see. Scientists can see them because it's yeah, just, scientists can see them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. While we're on the subject of mind, and I was reminded that I did psychology actually, but as a bachelor's, and um, and we called it the science. It was called the science of human behaviour. Right. It was not called the science of mind. Yeah. And they never used the word mind on yeah. reflection. They never used it. They did not make the assumption that there was such a thing as a mind. It was, yeah. it was about what does the human do under certain circumstances. And it didn't even give the assumption that there was such a thing as a person, although they did do personality testing. Yeah. So there was a kind of an assumption. <laughs> yeah. But well, it's, it's, just common, it's just common parlance that yeah. they'd say, you know, um, you know, I've changed my mind. That's fine, everybody knows what that means. Yeah. But you wouldn't use the word mind in a discussion in psychology, yeah. um, at least not as a science, as a science. It's, it, it just doesn't, there's no assumption that that ever existed. So yeah. it's, it's a bit like, to me, it sort of sounds like <coughs> chakras, you know, we think of chakras and we think they exist. Yeah. It's, an, it's There's no science that, well, there may be now some peripheral sciences that, um, that talk about, or para, para whatever, so yeah. sciences, but when I did psychology anyway, nobody talked about minds. Yeah. And in fact, if you said, I want to find out about my mind, um, it's a good way of not being accepted on the course. <laughs> yes. We were told. Yeah. Yeah. My favourite quote from an encyclopedia of psychology, I can't remember who edited it, was under the entry for consciousness. And it said, nothing worth reading has ever been written about this. <laughs> and that was in about 1985, and I think that still stands today, wherever we are now. Yeah. Richard, I meant to ask you earlier, as, I don't know, things fall away, things are seen, hopelessness arises, then... I certainly experienced physical consequences within the body, a period where there was exhaustion of this feeling. Right. But, um, have you heard of people, perhaps, on a physical level, releasing the contraction? The contraction that is me. Yeah, I think anything can happen. Mm. Anything can happen. 
and there can be, I mean, certainly there are reports of a lot of, a lot of energy mm-hmm. being, when I say released, being kind of like freed up yeah. when this is seen sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can happen, yeah, yeah. or not. Uh, absolutely no rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> does the seeing of the nothingness fullness, does it have to be noted? Does it have to be noted? Do you mean noticed? No, noted. Noted, as in the local clicked or whatever. <laughs> noted. <laughs> if it, I suppose it's noticed because there's a change, or there's a different experience. Experience has changed. Yeah. I don't know. Obviously, I don't know. But, do, but does it have? Well, I, I, does it have to be noted, i.e., uh, named or whatever? No. no. Of course. No, I thought not. Oh. Of course. Yeah. So, just happened. But it may be. It yeah. might. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Yes, it's about the body, physical uh, sensation. Um, I sometimes feel like a folding balloon. Uh, physically, it feels like um, floating in the air. Floating? Yeah. Right. That, that's how the body sometimes feels. Right. But it, I'm healthy, um, but it's been about uh, two years, my physical body feels like floating in the air. Did you ever experience that? No. No. Sounds very pleasant. Is it very pleasant? Yeah, it's yeah. nice. It's not bad, but it's just very different to what it used to. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. physically, the body is all sort of like I can feel uh, um, unseen movement. Movement. Right. Not seen. Like it's not physical, but I can feel movement. A lot of movement. In the yeah, in the body. Right. What sort of movement? Well, it's it's a uh, it's like folding. Okay. Oh right. Yeah. Okay. It yeah. It feels like folding. Yeah. But there's no sign or anything. It's just how it feels. Yeah. 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 So that that just 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 uh, how it happens. Yeah. I can't really co- comment, but it is common in both, you know, I call it an awakening event, you know, and the kind of complete, the complete scene, let's say, of everything and nothing. It's very common for there to be absolutely no sense of physicality left, you know, with the body at all, which is why you get these descriptions like, you know, um, uh, there's no space. Because if there's no physicality here, which is a space word, obviously, but there's still, and I'm going to use this word awareness very incautiously, you know, it's not that there's no physicality because physical death has occurred. Physical death hasn't occurred, there's no physicality. Therefore, here and there, space becomes meaningless. Because whatever's left is nowhere and everywhere. Well, it's everywhere, but because it's everywhere, there isn't really everywhere anymore. Mm. And this is why you also get descriptions like, you know, here and there seem to be the same. Or seem to be the same. Here and there are known to be the same. Because what makes here and there is physical location. No physical location, there's no here and there. What seems to be there, that wall, and here, this body, are the same. Same. So no here and there. No space. That's why you sometimes get this description. There's no space, no time, no space. Yeah, yeah. But that's not... It doesn't matter. No, no, I... I, I, I (laughs) It's just interesting, really, that's all. Well, it's interesting if if you find it interesting. Uh, It's impossible to see that. It's impossible. To see that. It's impossible for the person who feels separate to apparently voluntarily see that. Yes, it is impossible. 
It can, however, happen, apparently, if the person disappears. And it may have some similarity with certain drug-induced experiences. But I don't really want to go there because it's sort of a separate thing. If it's seen, it's seen. If it's seen, it's seen, yeah. yeah. Incontrovertibly, if it's seen, it's seen, yeah. And it makes no difference. Makes no difference to what? To the way of living as it is being. Well, it may do. It may make no difference, it may make a profound difference. There are stories of um, apparent people for whom this seeing happened and they just sat on a park bench for the next two years. So it can make a profound difference or no difference at all. So this can be seen and the next morning the apparent person gets up and goes to the office to work as usual or it can be seen and for two years that apparent person just sits on a bench looking at the horizon. Yeah. Yeah. But whatever might happen, will happen. Yeah. It is, it's no one in control. Yes. Well, it's, it's worse than there's... I, I keep coming back to this. It's much worse than there's no one in control. Yeah. There is no one. There is no one. No one exists. I mean, there is no one in control. We kind of maybe imply that there's lots of ones who aren't in control. No. Yeah. There's no one. Yeah, that's the point why seeing the war and the body, like, it makes no difference. Say that again, what makes no difference? Seeing the war and the body as not there and here. Yeah. Seeing that makes no It may make a profound difference. See, you mean seeing, seeing that this is not separate from that. And I really mean seeing it, I don't mean thinking it philosophically. Seeing that this is not different to that, may make a profound difference. Yeah, it may do. But to no one, the profound to, but difference... But to no one, exactly, yeah. to no one. But nevertheless, that profound difference may apparently manifest in the character that's left. See, unless physical death has occurred, there's a character. See you, Tony. Bye. Yes, I know we are kind of in a loop, but... <laughs> yeah, I think it's important to understand that kind of in a loop. <laughs> Let's see if we can get out of it then. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm out now. <laughs> oh, okay, you're out of the loop. I didn't even realise we were in a loop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm out now. Yeah. Yeah. But the seeing of this can make a prof can, may make a prof I mean, even that, what I was talking about, that split second of awakening, where it's just seen that there is no one at all, there's no time. There. I mean, my, you know, just a split second. That can produce, for example, it can produce a profound and very, very restful state of despair. Mm. It can do. Yeah. Because what it tends to leave is the kind of sense that there is still something to be found. So there's still a seeking, mm. but now there's a knowledge that there's no one who can do anything about that. It's almost like an algebraic formula, you know, like recognition of emptiness plus seeking energy equals despair. Because, um, you know, there's still a seeking going on, but there's the recognition there's no one who can do anything about that. So, that, you know, was, I mean, seeking for a person can be delightful. I can't tell you how much seeking that, you know, this did. And if you want to know, read the book about it. But, you know, that is wonderful. <coughs> seeking, and there's this wonderful guru who's going to... Oh, give it to me and I'm just so in love. And so that seeking energy is still there, but now instead of the guru, there's despair. That can be quite difficult, but it could also be quite restful. It's really hard trudging up mountains with rucksacks on your back to get to that guru's cave. You know, you got a rucksack full of imodium and you're trudging <laughs> up the mountain to get to the guru's cave. <clears throat> and you don't know when you get there, the guru might turn around and say, you are not worthy, go away. It's really hard work. It can be, maybe. And as a memory now. Yeah. <laughs> as a memory now? Yeah. What about it? No, I had, well, it's, it was, you know, it's colourful. 
it's colourful. There's a whole book about it. <laughs> I can't resist throwing that in as an advertisement. <laughs> no, it can be really, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us, you know, I don't know if a lot of us, I guess that a lot of us have possibly had quite an exciting time in what, you know, in the spiritual fun yeah. fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's fun. It can be fun, can't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. And there's a lesson where we orange and these beads and people go up to me and ask me what it was about. Yeah. We never tell them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the malas and the crystals and the guru yeah. photographs and the magic. Oh. <laughs> Happy days. Yeah. Yeah. But when that energy's gone, it's gone. There's nothing. You know, when the that seeking energy is gone, or that belief has gone, it's gone. You know, there's no one in control of it, there's no one doing it. Again, okay? it's just yeah. a colourful thing that apparently happens. Yeah. 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 Are you familiar with the Brahman consciousness state that is... Brahman consciousness state that is in the Vedic teachings? Almost um, certainly not. Do you want to say more? I was going to ask if it is the same thing as non-duality from your perspective. I don't know. I haven't read much about it either, but it, it seems that they say the same thing about that too. Like nothing exists. So the, 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 thing that, the only thing that, co that comes to me, and I'm risking immediately making a great fool of myself, because I don't know very much about that tradition, but the two things that immediately come to me that I've said before, Brahma and Brahmin are one. Okay, so the individual and the all are the same thing. So that seems to me to resonate very much with what's being said here. And the other thing is that I, you know, I love the description of Satchitananda, the, um, the characteristics of whatever the hell this miracle <coughs> is, being Satchitananda, because that's... Um, I, mean, I know it can be translated in different ways, but I shall choose consciousness, energy, love, or consciousness, energy, bliss, take your choice. And that seems to me, although I resist the word consciousness, I'm quite happy with it in this case, because it seems to me consciousness, energy, and love, I'm going to stick with unconditional love, two of those three are in the realm of what I always call the bleeding obvious. They are bleeding obvious, and if anybody denies them, I don't believe them. You know, I don't think that they're being... Um, I'm trying to think of the uh, word they use in existentialism. I don't believe they are saying that in good faith. I think they are saying it in bad faith if they deny two of those things, because they're so bleeding obvious. And one is energy, and the other is, I'll stick, the word consciousness is, is dodgy, consciousness or experience, right? It is obvious that there is experience. If you want to call that consciousness, that's fine. It's obvious there's experience. And if anybody denies that, I think, no, 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 you know, John Paul Sartre would have a thing to say to you about bad faith, mate. <laughs> so there is experience, cons consciousness, awareness, if you want that, right? Uh, because there's experience, because something's happening, obviously there's energy, right? Nothing, you know, there can't be experience without energy. So those two things seem to me completely obvious, right? The third one, bliss, unconditional love, whatever, however you want to translate ananda, that's the one that people are going to say, well, excuse me, mate, it doesn't look to me like this is all unconditional love. To which the only thing, again, you know, I could say is the same thing I would be saying if I hadn't brought Satchez and Andrew into this, which would be just, well, I'm sorry, I can't explain it. <coughs> it's just the case, and when it's seen, it's seen. There's nothing really more that can be said about that. So I think, in a way, yes, this is a reconfiguring of the basics of that tradition. The problem with traditions, as we might notice with the Buddhist tradition, the Christian tradition, so forth, is that the longer in the story of time they go on, the more complicated they get, because that's what the mind does. So by the time, you know, by the time we're talking about it 
these are terrible sacrilegious words. I shall probably be struck off the register of non-duality teachers for this, non-duality speakers for this, you know. So here and now, right, everything you know becomes more and more and more complicated as the mind develops it further and further and further. And so it becomes more and more difficult in, say, Buddhism or in the yogic traditions or whatever, to see those absolutely fundamental basics because the mind tends to build curlicues and ornamentation and complexities on simplicity. It's just what the mind does. So you start with, I don't know, the simple <coughs> pronouncement of somebody wandering around in the area of Galilee who may or may not have historically existed in the story of time. And 2,000 apparent years later, you have a leading church you know, with all its nonsense. I hope that's recording. <laughs> I said the bleeding church with all its nonsense. I got the thumbs up. It's being recorded. So I went off on a bit of a, of a riff there, but no, going back to it, yes, such is an end. Why don't you like the word consciousness? Because um, I've never heard anyone say anything rem that remotely made sense about it. It just seems to me one of those words that just causes intelligent people to spew endless garbage, that's why. <laughs> but I mean, it's fine, is it? You know, if people find I don't know, watching two and a half hour videos and somebody talking about some scientist talking about consciousness as if it's something that could ever be explained, you're fine. You know. It's just not my bag, as they say. It's getting late in the afternoon, isn't it? We're almost over, and I think it's something to do with the combination of chocolate biscuits and caffeine I've had. It tends to make me go a bit too loose tongued at this stage in the afternoon. We may have to cut some of this out from the video, we'll see. I mean, it just kind of generates endless, endless, you know. And because there's nothing to be said about it, because it can't be understood. It will, I'm going to make a confident assertion here, which may well be wrong, but that doesn't knock my confidence in it. I'm going to make a confident assertion in this. The fact that, you know, I'll use the word again, you know, I hope the League of Non-Duality Speakers forgives me for this, but I'm going to make a confident assertion that consciousness or awareness or the fact that we are capable of having experience, however you want to put it, I confidently assert that will never be understood. In other words, how subjective experience can arise from what seems to be physical matter. There's a chapter in a wonderful book I could recommend to you called How Does Matter Think? Which is the neatest way of expressing that problem I've ever come across. It's a wonderful way putting the problem of consciousness, and I, I wish I thought of it myself, but I didn't. Mm. How does matter think? How does this stuff, this stuff, apparent organic matter, apparent, you know, the three great mysteries of being that philosophers sometimes talk about, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? I wish I hadn't said three because I've forgotten at least one of them, but there are three. <laughs> Trust me on this, if, if nothing else. Why is there something rather than nothing? How does awareness or consciousness arise? Oh, there are three. Yeah, why is there something rather than nothing? How does the organic arise from the inorganic? In other words, how come there's life from an inorganic <coughs> universe? And... Um, how does matter think? How can inorganic matter give rise to awareness or consciousness? And of those three, I would say the third one is by far the most intractable. I mean, they're all intractable, but the third one's the most intractable. So it's just a kind of, you know, what is consciousness? How does it work? Blah, 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 blah. Quantum bloody physics is going to explain consciousness. No, it isn't. 
You know that riposter, you know Roger Penrose? I mean, I like Roger Penrose, I really like Roger Penrose, but, you know, one thing I think he's really wrong about, he came up with this theory that consciousness can be explained by um, subatomic particles yeah. in microtubules in the brain. Well, he might be right, but so what? What does that explain? Absolutely explains nothing. And there's this wonderful put, that put down from another physicist called Patricia Churchins, who said, um, uh, quantum activity in microtubules in the brain producing consciousness has about as much explanatory power as saying consciousness is created by pixie dust. And I thought, yes, absolutely. And if you kind of lost this conversation at this point, I apologise. I'm sorry, I just got on it. I'll put some of the things, yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like Penrose as well. Yeah, I love him to bits on almost every other matter, but, you know. I think, I think he got that bit wrong. I think he got that bit wrong, yeah. 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 So I think the problem of consciousness, we're running over time now, I think if we'd stopped on this two minutes early we would have had a chance of solving it, <laughs> but I'm sorry, we've run, I've run you out of time, so if you're going to solve the problem of consciousness you're going to have to do it on your own time now. And um, could you ring your answers into God please when you've solved it? God, God will mark your answers. Okay, well, thank you for coming. We're out of time now. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.